Hi, I'm Francois Audouy. I was the production designer on Ghostbusters Afterlife, and this is the Go Creative Show. Hello and welcome to the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. My name is Ben Consoli, and today we speak with Francois Audouy, production designer for Ghostbusters Afterlife. Francois, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Connor. I'm excited to be here. So my name is Ben. Our producer is Connor. Oh. But you know what? <laughs> that is fine because he's going to love hearing that when you say that. So I'm going to leave it in. <laughs> That's really funny because I'm just going by my emails and I saw Connor at the top of the page. This so is what happens. I think it's I think it's his grand plan to... Push me down a staircase and take over the show one day. I think that's going to happen. It's only because he bolds and underlines his name and puts exactly. it in capitals. This is the guy you're talking to. Well, who knows? <laughs> Maybe one day he will be up here <laughs> hosting this thing. <laughs> but so not funny. today. Today, it's actually me, Ben Consoli. Um, <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. I just mentioned before we rolled, I saw Ghostbusters Afterlife last night. And I really, really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. It looks great. Really nice writing. Like, I don't know. It, it, it has like the vibe that you need in these times. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it's a breath of fresh air, isn't it? It's really a good, it's a good time. It's a great, a great night out and it's light and, uh, and rolls right along. Yeah. I yes, agree. It is exactly what we need right now. Um, and it was, and it was awesome. And I can't wait to talk about it because the production design in this is just, it must've been so much fun to work on. But before we dive in, I just want to mention our sponsor for today's episode, MZ Empowering Filmmakers. M-Z-E-D, Empowering Filmmakers. And of course, remind you to follow us on your favorite podcast app and hit subscribe so you never miss an episode, as well as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, where you can not only hear, but see this entire interview. You can find us there and all everything you need to know about Go Creative Show is at gocreativeshow.com. So first of all, like we mentioned at the top, like it is, um, uh, it's the perfect movie for right now. It just... It's enjoyable. You can bring your family there. It's a blast. I think it has a lot of great Easter eggs to the original Ghostbusters, and it just is a fun watch. And I wanted to start with the fact that you're coming into a franchise that had some bumps in the road. I mean, the last the last Ghostbusters that came out had so much like weird negative attention to it in social media, and I didn't really understand why, and there's no reason to delve into it, but regardless... Mm -hmm. You're coming into a franchise that the audience has a real strong expectation about. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel when you get brought onto a project like that? Well, you know, uh, I, I actually went in and uh, went in for an, uh, an interview with, uh, with Jason Reitman, uh, who had heard about my work on Ford versus Ferrari and not knowing what the project was that he wanted to discuss. And so I met with him at, uh, at Sony and he was at Ghost Corps, which is this building that is everything Ghostbusters. So I'm like, hmm, this is an interesting because I don't, didn't really associate just Jason with Ghostbusters. And I immediately knew that he wanted to talk to me about, about Ghostbusters, but it was a very, it was very, very early days and no one had really, they, they had the script that he had written with his writing partner, Gil Keenan. And that was basically it. And so he, he told, told me the story and I just immediately got excited about it because it was definitely his, his own uh, spin on the on the on the material, with all new characters, a whole new uh, uh, take on 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 the, on the material. But uh, it became apparent that he had such love for the original movie, and I had such fond memories of the original movie that came out in 1984. I was ten years old. I grew up in a small town, not unlike Somerville, actually, but a small town in Southern California. That was uh, a citrus sort of agricultural community, and we had this one old movie theater that showed uh, a move one movie a week at seven thirty. And I remember seeing Ghostbusters there, and along with a lot of these movies from the mid eighties that really shaped me, shaped and and shaped the kind of filmmaker that I that I am. Mm -hmm. And so, so um, so working on something like this kind of brings you back to those days. It must. So anyway, I was saying that we had Faden Papa Michael, the DP of Ford vs. Ferrari, on the show um, when it was released. I didn't know you worked on that show. That's that that was another great film for sure. Um, yeah, that must have been. Yeah, and and you know, I think that I was kind of cast in this movie uh, Ghostbusters by Jason as the production designer, uh, in in part because of my work on Ford vs. Ferrari, which was very grounded and very. Uh, 
you know, it was, it was, it was the kind of production design that I think that he was looking for mm. in Ghostbusters. In other words, he wanted to, to, he wanted it to feel real and, uh, and, uh, not sort of like a synthetic sort of, uh, compy sort of visual effectsy, you know, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like a yep. very sort of location based set based practical based, uh, approach, which, which, is sort of what I've I've been doing for the last ten years, working on movies that that go uh, to difficult locations and uh, where it's it's hot and, and and you're not on a soundstage uh, for 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 seventy days. You know, you're you're kind of out in the world. That must kind of excite you as a production designer to have to create real sets. I mean, not that there's no design that goes on in sound stages, obviously, but there's a unique kind of rewarding challenge of being on location. I'm assuming from, from your perspective, is that, do you mm -hmm. agree? I, I completely agree. And I, you know, I just, um, I, I really like movies that don't feel air conditioned, you know, that you kind of feel the, the surroundings you feel, you know, I'm, part of my job as a production designer is I'm, I'm trying to help the audience feel something and how can you get the audience to feel something through the setting? Um, and so I'm always trying to like question the, what's written on the page in terms of the slug lines. I mean, 99% of the time it's just fine, but is there something that I can bring to it that through the, the settings for each scene that can enhance the sort of the narrow narrative, um, uh, emotional sort of, uh, thread that, that, the director is trying to portray, you know? Mm. So, so, um, can you point to an instance I, like that? I mean, in Ghostbusters, one, one thing I noticed watching through it is that props got quite a bit of close ups, and, um, you, yeah. you saw a lot of that. And I love that because I think that having a quick close up of like a glass or an old newspaper or just whatever, I'm not particularly from the film, but just in general, when you add close ups of these little elements within a new environment that you're kind of experiencing and, and, um, and, uh, navigating as an audience member, like when we go to the farmhouse or, or any of these things, you, those little details really help you understand the location you're in. Um, mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff that I noticed. Well, yeah. I mean, in terms of props, I mean, Ghostbusters is a hardware movie and it, it always has been. And so you're kind of expected to, to, uh, show some of that stuff off. And I think that there, I mean, I know that there was a lot of love that went into painstakingly recreating those artifacts from 84 and, um, and, but there's also a lot of storytelling in each of those props. They're not gratuitous in any way. I mean, I feel like they, they're, 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 they're invented to tell a story or to do a specific thing. So the inserts and stuff are, are telling the audience that this prop or this device is, is doing something that's important to the story. Um, but in terms of like, of feeling stuff, I mean, you know, um, the Ghostbusters was shot in Calgary in, um, outside of Alberta. Mm. Uh, I mean, outside of Calgary in Alberta, and it's not generally a place you go to make a big budget sort of, uh, Hollywood movie. You, um, uh, Classically, you go there for westerns and for the sweeping vistas, and and you know, uh, D Days of Heaven was shot there, and and a, and a lot of great westerns. I mean, um, uh, Unforgiven was shot in northern uh, Alberta, so it wasn't the easiest place to go in terms of like infrastructure. You know, I mean, there were we were lucky enough to to go into to shoot in these brand new sound stages that had been built there, um, which were the only sound stages in town, but. But we went there really because we wanted the audience to feel something that came with being on location, very much in the spirit of the 84 film, which was all obviously shot in Manhattan, with, with the city being a real character in the movie. So this was, uh, Jason had this great perspective in that he said the first movie was vertical with Manhattan, and this movie's horizontal mm. with with the, 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 the landscapes of, of Calgary. Um, so, you know, Alberta is the northern part of the Great Plains, and you get the same sort of sweeping um, fields of, of wheat and, and corn and barley that you get all the way down in Oklahoma, a lot of the similar sort of like um, vibe of that. So, I mean, it's, it's, um, it was very exciting to be able to lean into capturing those real landscapes. And to your original question, we built the farmhouse, which is probably the most important set of the movie, out in a barren field 
um, about 45 minutes south of, south of, of Calgary. Yeah, let's let's he, talk about that farmhouse because it's a major part of the film. It's you know aesthetically really stunning to look at. It's got so much detail in it. And I'd love to talk to you about kind of the way that was the way that that was created. Yeah, well, the um, Jason had gone on a scout right before he brought me on, and he had been to a couple different um, locations, and he had gone up to Calgary and was really um, impressed by by what he saw up there. Um, you're right that the, the 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 farmhouse is a really important set in the movie because um, it's all backstory and it's a representation of um harold ramus's character you know um it's so i i had to tell a lot of you know i had to, a couple decades of of backstory i had to tell visually in that in that house exactly um and you discover so, more about it throughout the like as the story goes all the way to the very last yeah. five minutes you're discovering well, about this house th i mean what a dream really for a production designer to have the main characters happen upon a, a mysterious location and then um, explore it and then learn more about the the story from the environment from the location mm. that's that actually happens a couple times in in the, the screenplay which I, I really was drawn to you know the, there's a lot of discovery and exploration and mystery in the setting and I was I thought that was really exciting to um, to design to let the the environments um, do a lot of the the supporting work for the story for the the mystery of the story. Um, so yeah, you're right with the with the house. Um, we had an, first we we looked at dozens and dozens of actual farmhouses and barns and things in Alberta, and we would always find like a great barn with no house or a great house with no barn mm. or a barn on a, on a not interesting piece of la landscape or a house, you know, we needed a great canvas, a great house and a great barn. And you could never, we could only get one of those three things. <laughs> so we ended up, um, I, I, I really pushed hard to, to, to do something where we would have absolute control and make it as good as we could possibly make it. So we found, um, a really beautiful knoll um, that was frozen over when and covered in snow when we went first went to go scout it, but it had this great view up onto this ridge, so that we could put the house above the horizon, very much like the psycho house mm. is. You know, you're always looking up at the house with the sky in the background. Yes, and um, we started from scratch, and we I did a lot of research looking at actual um, the vernacular of farmhouse architecture from the Midwest and, and Oklahoma. Uh, we got lucky and we found it in a magnificent barn with a, uh, a collapsed roof that we were able to uh, salvage and take apart uh, plank by plank and re-erect no on site, which was really kind of, I, I wasn't sure that was going to work, but it, it was a, a, a miraculous feat of engineering by the construction team. So that barn and, was disassembled and reassembled with its yeah. original caved in roof. Yeah. I mean, you look at this, when we went, looked at this, uh, when we scouted the barn, it was kind of remarkable that it was still standing. It looked like it was ready to fall over at any minute, mm. you know? So we, we had to, um, it was also old peeling lead paint, you know, it was, a. Uh, an environmental disaster area <laughs> and so we had to go in with a team and uh and seal everything with a transparent uh, uh paint basically to seal all of that peeling paint and then disassemble everything with with a construction team basically in hazmat suits uh log all of the you know all of the pieces of the barn so that we could put it back together like a big puzzle piece oh and then God. transport it a couple of hours away to our new location <laughs> that and is then, then, wild. But then the hard thing, I guess the other, well, not just the hard thing, but another challenge was then you have to put it together in, in a safer way that is not going to just fall down uh, on top of the crew. So they were able to, um, to put all of this structure invisibly into the house, into the barn to make it uh, appear decrepit, but, but be completely structurally sound. Oh my God. So the barn was, uh, uh, the barn was completely brought over and rebuilt. The house, did that come from scratch? 
Yeah. Okay. So the house, the, the house that was the first thing that we started designing, um, and the first thing we started building when we got to Calgary, uh, the house, the 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 house had its own set of challenges too, because we we uh, realized very early on that we actually needed two farmhouses. We needed a house on location um, because there was a ton of location work with interiors, full interiors and exteriors, um, like a real 360 wow. interactive set. And then we also needed a house on stage because the third act, which I'm not going to spoil for everybody, but the third act is set uh, at night and uh, the whole gang ends up there and we needed control to be able to shoot at night with underage actors who, who um, are protected, you know, uh, they, they can only shoot until like nine or 10 o'clock at night, right? Mm -hmm. So they can't shoot all night long every day. So we wanted to, uh, we really needed the control for special effects and for shooting during the day of, of a stage set at night. So that, that set was, uh, was, uh, was completely doubled up as an interior exterior on stage with um, corn that we had to harvest in Southern Alberta and bring up and put on uh, stands and, um, and a part of a barn and a, and a field and the whole, the whole deal, uh, lots and lots of detail there. That is wild. So the, the actual set that was in the field, um, not on the soundstage that you built, I'm surprised to hear you say that that was built for interior shooting. My, I just wrongfully assumed apparently that you built the facade and did all the interiors on a studio, uh, in, in a studio. Mm. Well, you know, um, Eric Steelberg, the DP, and Jason, who have worked together their entire careers, um, they really come from the world of, of of location filming. You know, they're, this is this was the kind of the first. Well, for, certainly for Jason, it was the first sort of stage green screeny sort of movie. But I, I really love Jason movie Jason's movies and his um, and how kind of like authentic and real they felt. And so I felt we, we I wanted to give him the same sort of experience. You know, of like. Of, of, of the farmhouse feeling like a location. Um, and there's this, there's a lot of, there, there's, a, there's definitely a feeling when the family first gets there that they're going in and into an actual house that was, is there. Yeah. And you can, you can, you know, f feel the, the warm air coming in through the window and you can smell the barley. And I mean, there's a real uh, authenticity to it that uh, I think was important to capture. Um, so yeah, the interior, the first, we did the first floor interior, um, as a, as a full dress on location and then ended up doubling that and moving the dressing over to a stage. The second floor was only on, on the stage set. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I'm, I, I mean, I, I like, I just like sets that are, that don't have a lot of wild walls and, and, uh, a lot of that, that, that are sort of, you know, you really feel like you're, you're actually there and you're not. You know, you're not pulling a, a, a wall out and getting way back. You're you're really feeling like you're inside inside the space. Um, Did um, you get any pushback from producers or you know, any of the departments saying like, okay, we can build this whole thing in a soundstage, but we're going to build it practically and we're going to shoot actually in this house on the field? Like, <laughs> did you get any pushback yeah. at all? Or was everybody down for it? There's always. I, I wouldn't call it pushback. I mean, there's always challenges in that there's only so much sand you know that, that you're given uh for your hourglass in the beginning of the show and it's never enough mm. no matter what the project is so it's part of my job is is i mean I, I is trying to get make best use of the resources just like any sort of you know creative department head like i'm, I'm trying to make the best choices and and uh, of course it's more expensive to to build a set but i'm also you know, we're collaborating and we're talking about efficiencies and, um, shooting sp speed and, and, and what, what we get creatively from these tough decisions. And, um, and then, you know, you, you put, you take some of the, the resources away from other areas and, and you put them in, in, in the things that are very important. I just thought the farmhouse was a very important part of the story. Yeah. And, um, you know, as, in terms of like my own gut instincts, you know, I, I, I was really, I love the movies of the 1970s and 1980s in particular, like the transition from, from, uh, stage movies, like at the, you know, MGM musicals and that kind of stuff to when movies started going on location, like, um, like, you know, Bonnie and Clyde with the great 
that, that great movie, Dean Tavalaris designed it, where you're, you're going to actual sets built on location and it had a, it had a completely radical sort of aesthetic shift with um in hollywood and i and i so that for, for me you know i wanted to make i wanted to make a ghostbusters bonnie and clyde sort of movie you know like mm-hmm. that kind of thing like or, or, or days of heaven where they actually have a farmhouse interior exterior farmhouse and you really feel it you know you don't it's not a it's not a it's not fake, you know, it's, uh, as, uh, it's, 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 it's the, it's the real deal. And it just feels immersive and, and authentic and, and relatable in, in every, at every turn. Those details are, I think, what elevates it from like a kid's teenager movie into an adult audience. Like those, those are the textures and the details that make somebody that is just a fan of film enjoy something like this, I think. And um, you guys just did a spectacular job on that. I wanted to talk. I, I wanted to ask you specifically about the the like when you're you built the set, and we were talking earlier that the farmhouse set in Ghostbusters Afterlife has to do a lot of heavy lifting. It needs to be an environment that's new to the actors um, in the story, an environment that's obviously new to the audience, and hold attention for an hour and a half, you know, I know you're not there the whole time, but you go back to it frequently. It also has to tell the backstory of a character that isn't alive. This, this grandfather that, that dies in the first couple of minutes. So, um, there's a lot that it has to do. How do you go into a scenario like that and dress it in a way or prop it in a way that allows you to tell that story? And that has to be an incredible challenge. Yeah. Well, I think, um, Part of my job is really uh, obsessing about backstory, character backstory. When you read a script, it doesn't tell you anything other than what's happening in the present, usually. It doesn't tell you what's happened before page one. It doesn't tell you the backstories of the characters. So I have a lot of uh, endless sort of uh, conversations with my set decorator um, about what happened before. And um, with... With Egon's character, he, it's a mystery. You don't know what happened before. And again, you know, the, the, the farmhouse, I'm trying to put a lot of detail into that space that, that, that is um, full of sort of that creates sort of like a logical story of a man who lived in this house and was very in a very, very remote setting in the middle of Oklahoma. And, um, and what that did to him, you know, emotionally or psychologically, right? So there's uh, in his, you know, the, you walk in on the left. There's a study, um, and it, and the walls are covered with with what he's been uh, learning about Somerville, and with maps and with artifacts and with um, archi- ar- archaeological sort of research, and 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 you know, he's 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 come there in because of this mountain and, and because of this mystery. And so I'm trying that, that gives me an opportunity to do a surface sort of like tease of Mm -hmm. the, of literally what's happening above the surface in this, uh, in this city, in this town, in this small town. Um, and then the right, when you walk in, there's the dining room and the kitchen and the kitchen, you know, it, it tells the story of, of a single man, who's elderly and who is, uh, doesn't have the best culinary habits and likes Twinkies and what have you. And, you know, there's all this sort of like detail upon detail upon detail and, you know, a few opportunities for Easter eggs, like the old toaster and things like that that are kind of fun, but there's a, a, you're, you're just trying to layer it, layer, layer the authenticity and the, the realism of it. And then, you know, what's, what's great about the mystery of the farmhouse is that then there's, you peel back the, the eggshells, pieces and then you find other secret rooms you know there's a secret room that we come across that's his lab and it has all sorts of wonderful um uh details that are all that are just total you know it's like it's how this is his world right so i mean we we did the uh there's a whole wall of of fungus and mold experiments uh as an ode to some of the dialogue from the 84 film there's there's a wall of, uh, of, of university certificates and there's his workbench. And I mean, it, it's his lab. And so th- that was just an incredibly rewarding, uh, set. And one of the first, I think one of the first or second sets that we shot, and it was like, 
it was like wow everybody was so excited and on, on the on the crew and the, and the cast to to walk into egon's lab for the first time yeah. because everything that you saw was egon all everything that you i mean this is a, an engineer and a somebody you know and a, and a brilliant scientist and it was just a geek fest uh times times a, a thousand you know yes <laughs> so, i i love that and you had mentioned there's quite a bit of easter eggs in the film and there certainly are how inspired were you by the original like was there a sense on set that we are paying homage to the original ghostbusters or was it always this sense of we're creating something new I think it was kind of both, but look at the, the reason that, that I got excited in my first meeting with Jason about the project was because of the original film. Mm -hmm. And I, I was such a fan, uh, of the production design by John DeCure senior senior, who was, was this sort of, you know, he was a great production designer and he, and it's, this is one of his last films that he, he ever did, but he, he took the Ghostbusters movie, which is kind of a, you know, it's a little bit of a light, silly concept that could be interpreted a, a number of different ways, but he, he brought to it a seriousness and, um, and he took it seriously as if it were, you know, a, a really important, important, and as important film as any film that you would do as an established production designer. And so I, I wanted to, I wanted to tap into that sort of original DNA from the first film that to me was so impeccably crafted just as, as a, as a, as a furniture cabinet, you know, it was a beautifully made piece of, of film furniture. Uh, and, and I wanted to make an, a movie that was also a, a nicely crafted film that didn't, that, that, that disregarded the fact that this was maybe a, a, a kid's story or a, or like a popcorn movie or whatever. I, I wanted to take it in, as, as seriously as, as, as any film that I've ever worked on, you know? So, um, so in the back of my mind, the 84 film was omnipresent because it was just, it's just so inspiring, yeah. but also, you know, the uh, Ghostbusters two is also a very, very well-crafted movie by, um, by Bo Welch, uh, another great production designer. We had an opportunity to uh, rebuild Ray's occult bookshop, and uh, so I, I called my friend uh, Tom Delfield, who was the art director on the film, who I've worked with several times. I worked with several times early in my career, and grilled. I couldn't find any original blueprints, and but we, we mean meticulously sort of recreated uh, Ray's bookshelf bookshop from the from the second film, and uh, that was that was just a, a total joy to sort of like piece together again, you know, and then have um have have dan Aykroyd come in and just be so elated and thrilled you know he came in and he's like oh my god it even smells the same <laughs> that must be so rewarding for you as a production designer first of all to have basically the entire cast of the original ghostbusters come back and uh and do you know their their piece in this starting with dan Aykroyd when you kind of have him first introduced and then at the end um when they all come back, which is a spoiler, but come on, if you're listening to this show, you don't mind spoilers or you've already seen it. So don't give me any crap. Um, <laughs> so anyway, but, um, but yeah, there's gotta be, a, a some, a real feeling of, you know, being rewarded when you have the original guy going in there and feeling like this was correctly done. Yeah. I mean, because the alternate, can you imagine how terrible that would be <laughs> yes. to be, to be, to have, you know, to not get it right. So, uh, I mean, fear, I always say fear is a great motivator, you know, you don't want to mess up. And, uh, but it, it was just such a thrill to, to, to get these opportunities, uh, to sort of recreate artifacts like that, that were so important to not only the cast, but to the audience. I love it. I want to talk about the car, the, uh, Ecto-1 Ghostbusters car, because one of my favorite scenes for sure is that big, crazy car. I want, I don't know if you can't really call it a car chase. I don't know what else to call it, but just the big car scene driving through town. Oh, I would going, call it, I'd call it a car chase. Car chase, there or you go. Chase, or a ghost chase. Ghost chase, exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, just such a fun scene. It, the, there's so much going on there and it looks like it was done practically. It looks like you are actually in the streets of a neighborhood. I'm curious, what is the truth about this? Talk to me about the car well, I, in that scene. I, Again, I think uh, I think you're reading my mail. Like uh, that's my whole thing: is practical when possible, and even when whenever possible, ask why I can't be practical. So we um, we built two ecto ones, actually two and a half ecto ones, basically for the movie, um, which was you know with every passing decade, it becomes 
uh, increasingly difficult to pull off because we're talking about a 1959 uh, Cadillac mm. and it's it's um, uh, a Miller Meteor conversion. So the, there are these cars that were converted by a coach works company to become um, either ambulances or, or, or like hearses, you know, and there's, there's not a lot of these things left in the world that they're very, very uh, difficult to find. And so the first thing was just to, to scour the, the North America to just to, to find one of these things. We, we ended up um, using the, uh, an Ecto one that Sony had in a storage container uh, from the second film and then purchasing a second Ecto one, a second, a 1959 Cadillac. Um, and then we took every, the, um, the, 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 the picture vehicle, uh, company took the whole, both cars apart and, and, and catalog every single piece of both cars. Like you would like, 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 uh, I don't know, like, uh, like forensically basically. So, so imagine walking into a garage and two cars are completely tore, taken apart and, and cataloged. And then every single piece, thousands and thousands of pieces were restored but then the cars, now the cars, it wasn't just a restoration job because the cars had to do three things. They had to be picture cars. So it had, they had to look great from the outside. They also had to be performance stunt uh, action vehicles, which meant that they had to perform um, at, at like a very high level. So the, the you know, the latest sort of, um, the latest engines were put in and mm. suspension and, and performance um, pieces under the hood to make them really get up and move. Uh, the suspension had to be completely uh, upgraded because the car ha- drives across a field, you know, so you have to have some pretty heavy duty suspension um, to support a four and a half ton vehicle. That's like 20 feet long. You know, yeah. the third thing that the car had to do is it had to, uh, it had to do some crazy practical special effects stuff. Like, we, uh, Jason had this vision of a scissor seat, like a gunner seat coming off and scissoring out from the side door, uh, which was a, just such a great, great concept, but, <laughs> but I, very hard to do <laughs> yeah. almost impossible. Very, very hard to do. It's like, how much more difficult can we make our task here? Uh, so believe it or not, we designed and engineered a fully, uh, practical scissor seat that was able to uh, hydraulically or pneumatically, I think actually pneumatically swing open the side door, which had to be reversed uh, from the original hinging at the same time, overlapping in the action, the, the, the seat has to scissor out at a very fast speed and the, and the seat has to rotate around 180 degrees. And then it should, that should be all be able to be done on cue. So, um, so then, so now what we're talking about is we're talking about three different groups of people working on the same patient that's on the table at the same time, you know? So you've got special effects, you've got picture cars, you've got, uh, and you've got scenic art department props, set dressing, all trying to get into the patient. (laughs) Basically, it was very exciting (laughs) to to get all that stuff, uh, uh, done to the fidelity that people wanted at, at the same time. Did you have any like malfunctions on set? Wow, you, we had so many, well, we had a lot of malfunctions happen at, during the testing phase. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that happened was when the car showed up in, in Calgary, uh, and, and it was being worked on in Los Angeles, but we had, um, the, the first day that we tested the car in the parking lot, the, the stunt driver took, he wanted to try to max out and, you know, he drove it as fast as possible and took it into a sideways uh, skid and the wheels fell off. Oh my God. Or one of the wheels fell, <laughs> broke. And it was like, please tell me you have and, footage of this somewhere. I don't know. Somebody may, may have, but <laughs> yes. this is why you do, this is why you do testing is so that it happens, uh, early enough so you can react. And, um, so we've learned that the, that, that, that the, the evolving nature of the stunt action, which was getting, you know, more, uh, you know, cinematic and big required a little bit of a souped up suspension. And, and so the car had to go back to LA and the, the, the wheels had to be, uh, we had to get even more, you know, sort of like robust, uh, uh, engineered, uh, I think Mustang 
uh, axles put on. My God, that, that I could just imagine you get the car that happens. You're like, now there's a huge delay. It's just the ripple effect of having something like that happen is unbelievable, but you must, you must assume that there'll be some issues along the way. There are always going to be things. I mean, this is why, this is what comes with practical filmmaking, you know, with, with practical filmmaking, there are, uh, challenges that, that come up where, where it's not, where it's live it's real you know i mean uh, uh, in ford versus ferrari we had similar challenges you have to you have to adapt you know we 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 uh the special effects department ford versus ferrari threw uh, a a replica ferrari like like 200 feet in the air with a custom uh rig you know and the the whole car sort of disintegrated in a non-cinematic way that had to be cleaned up in the computer later but it was still you're still doing it for real so there's something there's there's dividends that are paid for just the the effort that goes into that 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 creates like a visceral feeling you know it's it's harder but not just because but because it's harder doesn't mean you shouldn't do it yeah exactly let's take a moment and talk about mz empowering filmmakers now you want to think about mz as the hub of filmmaking education and it's kind of like a netflix model if you become an mz pro member because then you have access to everything on the site. And let me tell you what's on the site. I'm talking about hundreds of hours of high quality video-based filmmaking education that covers directing, cinematography, post-production, visual storytelling, and more. The quality of this course, uh, the quality of these courses is so high. These are really well done courses and clearly in topics that you are all interested in and I'm interested in. I mean, that's what it is here at Go Creative Show. Um, things like the Indie Film Blueprint, which is a, basically a roadmap for how to plan, shoot, and sell your first indie feature. Of course, Tom Cross, the editor of La La Land and Whiplash and No Time to Die, has a whole course on the art and technique of film editing. So, you know, you're working, you're, you're learning from industry professionals that are working at a high level in the filmmaking industry, like Vincent Laferre, Tom Cross, like we mentioned, Shane Hurlbut, Philip Bloom. It goes on and on and on. So that's what I mean by MZ being the hub of filmmaking education. And I've got a couple things for you to know. First of all, you can get 20% off of your purchase of either an individual course or an MZ Pro membership by using promo code GCS20 at checkout. And the best place to go is gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ to learn all about it. Now, don't forget that promo code because 20% off is definitely going to be a great deal for you guys. And you can find it at gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ. MZ, empowering filmmakers. Were you out in the streets um, uh, doing that, that, that car chase scene? Were you actually out in real streets or did you build any of that? Um, we were all out in real streets and in order to find Somerville, to create Somerville, this, this fictitious town in Oklahoma, we actually went to four different towns, um, around, uh, Alberta. Uh, we, we, so we, it was a, a, a kind of a, a mishmash of, of different towns. We had a, a town that was just the, the, the spinners diner, mm-hmm. which was built in an empty again it was built basically from scratch as an interior exterior um in a corner lot that that felt just perfect for that area of town and then we went to uh drumheller and drumheller to the east for another part of the town and then fort mcleod a couple hours south of calgary for another part of the town and um and just because we couldn't find a town that had everything Mm -hmm. you know so it was it's it's uh it, 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 I mean, that's the sort of the magic of production design is that you can, you can do these things and you can take, uh, you can suture l- multiple locations into the feeling of one perfect location. For the Walmart scene, which mm-hmm. was just awesome. <laughs> having, having the state pup marshmallow, the little mini state pup, uh, state pup, mini puffs, marsh, mini puffs exactly. Um, going crazy. And, in, in that Walmart was such a great scene. I have to assume that was a real Walmart. That was a real Walmart. And I, you know, the only thing I had to do in there really was change the prices from Canadian dollars to uh, U.S. dollars. Uh, It was, I I can't believe that we were able to shoot in a real Walmart. It, it uh, it was great. We shot, we, we shot over three nights uh, from like, you know, 
closing hours around 10 o'clock until uh, 5 a.m. or something. And uh, yeah, that was really great. Wow. Oh, so it was an active store up in, every single day up until you guys got in there? Yeah, it was so an active store. So you had to store. reset everything every time you came in? Yeah. And in fact, uh, <laughs> yeah, we had to reset everything. And it, so it took a couple hours to sort of set up and then a couple hours to put everything back together. We had, we did have to create sort of a 4th of July uh, dressing story and, and, and brought in specific gags for the mini puffs to interact with. And uh, it, the, 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 there's also sort of like a, a, a vignette with the terror dog that had to be set up for real because w there was, of course, a real uh, practical uh, terror dog that had been created uh for for the scene so yeah there were these little vignettes and we'd come in and sort of you know set it up but but all the backgrounds were completely real oh that's wild the last set that i want to talk about with you is we talked this basically this whole interview has been about your attempt to make things feel grounded and practical and real and i think you did a fantastic job of that but then you have this mountain tomb which is mm -hmm kind of like Indiana Jonesy, total fantasy, total ridiculousness. Um, and in, in incorporating that into a story that is so grounded, talk to me about your approach to that tomb to make it fit the overall film. Yeah. Um, I was, that was, that was really, uh, 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 really just, just pure fun to do. And, um, it, that was like four different sets that, had to be built for four or five different sets that had to be built to tell the story of going down this mine shaft, and discovering this underground chamber. Right. Um, we put the, the head frame of the mine on a real mountaintop, uh, in Alberta with, which was beautifully photographed by Eric with the sun setting and the background and everything you could see for, you know, miles and miles and miles off in all directions. <laughs> then we built, um, uh, like a mine shaft, a practical mine shaft that was 45 feet tall on stage for the kids going down, the elevator, the mine elevator, and then they open up into a chamber that was built on stage. And in terms of like making it feel grounded, you know, I mean, that was, uh, that was this film's ghost central, uh, and very much, uh, an ode to the original movie because ostensibly it was designed to look like it had been designed by the same architect, literally the mm -hmm. same architect who designed the, the ghost central, uh, building, uh, from the first film. So, we did a lot of research to, uh, in the architectural style that inspired that original building that was uh, that, you know, we looked at ziggurats and, and Mesopotamian art deco, basically, basically like, you know, East European and communist art deco and, uh, and tried to kind of infuse that into, into this, uh, this chamber that was a temple for this, for, this underground, this society to, to, to have their sort of like, uh, their, their gatherings in. Um, yeah, so that was a full 360 degree set on stage and the, the side of the temple crumbles open and these uh, stairs come out and then reveal a, uh, another set that we built also on stage. That was a, like a Canyon slot Canyon cul-de-sac, uh, with rock on, on three sides up to the, ceilings of the stage and these big stairs coming out uh for for you know kind of a showdown at the end but you know you're just you're just trying to do as much as you can and and and, and give uh give the camera as much as as, as you can and and yeah we we uh, we just uh built as much as possible but it, it's not to say that we were allergic to visual effects i mean the movie's got tremendous visual effects support you know but you, you, what you're trying to do is you're just trying to do as much as possible to give, to, uh, to, to, to give some, a, a, a nice grounded canvas to enhance upon later so that, so that there's something there. Exactly. Um, what would you say is the most challenging set that you had to build for this film and why? You know, look, like I said, I mean, farmhouse was incredibly challenging just because one thing that, uh, one thing that you that that I've learned about building big sets on location is that it's not not just you're not just showing up and just erecting some flats on a on a on an empty field. That's that's that would be way too easy. What you end up having to do is you have to be able to 
you have to make sure that that the the, the crew of a hundred people are not going to get uh, stuck in the mud, literally, of this remote location. So we had to excavate the entire, like an acre of this place, and put in road base and gravel and figure out the how, where the water was going to go, and then um, put down you know our own soil and everything so that it could the drainage would all work out because it rains guess what you know it rains in alberta mm. we had to we had to put in our own road we had to put in uh fake power lines we had to put in crew parking uh, all this kind of stuff and so wow so there's, you, were, you were really remote it was well yeah i mean it, it it was really remote and it had to because we that was the look that we were uh that that was required you know we wanted to be able to have those beautiful vistas in the background. So there, you, you, on the surface, you think, ah, you know, it's a farmhouse. It, you, when you look at the film, it just feels like, a, I mean, it kind of feels like a location. And But but there's a lot of work to make it look like we did nothing. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and I think so the expectation very... of, of, you know, just moviegoers now is because there's so much reliance on visual effects, you almost just assume, oh, they probably just extended the backgrounds. It's probably just in like, you know, anywhere and the the replacement of the skies and the backgrounds and all that. It's almost a surprise, or it is a surprise, to hear how much work went into making these things practical. The commitment oh, to yeah. being practical is pretty remarkable. Yeah, it's uh, it, it certainly is. And um, I think that was very ex- extremely challenging. I think that, you know, Ecto-1 was extremely challenging. Uh, because of what was being asked for it and and the ask was getting you know it, it as we got into it i think everyone got more excited about the possibilities of and and you know jason's vision for for making ghost busting a an active sport if you will you know before in, in ghostbusters movies you kind of stand there uh to catch ghosts mm-hmm. but this one he wanted to to, to put ghost busting on the move. And so that became a very, um, a, a very um, an, an interesting idea or just, just from a storytelling standpoint. So, so we really, I think Ecto one became more, uh, more important as we were working on it, um, as, as like an idea that we wanted to really hit out of the park, you know? So, um, and that of course was being done in LA and, and, and Calgary and together, a lot of different departments working together. And that, that made it very, very, um, complicated. There's a, also a, there's a, a, a pack built into the seat as well that had to be completely redesigned, but feel like part of the same vernacular from the first two films and, uh, and, and so on and so on, you know, yeah. there's, there's also, uh, uh, we haven't even talked about the RTV unit, the the remote ghost trap that had to be designed again as a practical remote controlled uh, device that is stored in a box in Ecto one. And then there's a, uh, there's a, like a ramp that, that it can be engaged in the back of the, of the vehicle for the Rover to sort of jet out, yes. shoot out the bottom of the car. So there's a lot of, a lot of really neat ideas uh, was that, that actually wanted. was that actually driving around with you guys, or was that added in in post? It was 100 uh, driving around. That yeah, it is was, insane. Uh, there was, For those that haven't well, seen it, it's like a remote control car holding that ghost trap, and it's just uh, I that shocks me. Even knowing how much practical you guys wanted to have in this film, I'm still surprised that that wasn't put in later. And and I think we only uh, destroyed one of those things on during shooting with that during a high speed chase out in the countryside the the car the car i think bumped into the uh in the rover and then it burst into flames or something oh, no. <laughs> but uh but yeah it was inc- it was incredibly maneuverable and could get up it could cook it could th- that thing could get up pretty fast and it was uh it was a, it was a fun little little uh little toy to build for sure well the whole film came together so well i really really enjoyed it and i know a lot of you guys listening most of you probably have already seen it but if you haven't certainly do um I want to end our conversation with a question from our audience. We have a question from Matthew Benson on Instagram, and thank you for this, asking for tips for aspiring production designers. Oh, you know, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, for anybody who wants to work in the movie business, the first thing is to just keep watching movies and watch the classics, you know, like 
go back in time and really, I think there's a, 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 a cinematic language that you have to be sort of fluent in that is grounded in, in uh, a lot of great classic films and just watch as much, uh, as much as much as possible. But in terms of production design, I think that that um, production design is really about uh, communicating sort of a, an idea in your head of what it should be and working and collaborating with artists and artisans who are able to, to make that idea, the ideas or the dream into realities. So um, I'm a big fan of like, uh, of drawing and, and, uh, and I think it's important to know how to draw because it's a great communication tool. Not, not that you have to be like the world's greatest artist, but it's, it's a, it's a very useful way of, of communicating ideas early on, even in, you know, quick sketch form. So I think it's, it's nice to be able to know how to draw. And I think that, um, uh, now it's very, very important to be conversant and, uh, adept in, uh, in digital sort of design tools with, uh, 3d, design and and 2d design and illustration on the computer and things and just try to be and try to just uh like have as many skill sets as possible in your arsenal and your in your bat belt as as a production designer you know i mean um I, I i started it took me many many years to be a production designer and i i worked as a graphic designer and as an as a concept illustrator and as an art director and i you know i can do drafting and and so all of those experiences over many many years help when you're working with uh with crew members and with artists who are better than you but you can have a, a conversation about the about the craft and about the furniture making that you're all trying to do together that cinematic furniture making to borrow a pun from earlier that is all really good advice i want to dig in just for one second about something a little bit more practical like those are all great to hone those particular skills and be well versed in cinematic language for sure. But is there like a first step to actually getting a gig? Like, should what what should should you be should you be looking for mentors? How should you become an art PA? Oh, like, what what do yeah. you think is a good first step for somebody that's thinking like, yeah, I'm honing all these crafts. I love film. I want to do this. What do I do? Well, I think that the first I always uh, suggest just to get a job in the department that you love. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You got to be around people who are, who are doing it. And, and, um, and don't worry too much about, about the end game, you know, like a lot of, a lot of kids today, you know, they want to immediately be <laughs> the production designer that it's probably not going to happen right away. It takes time and that's okay, but enjoy the process. You know, I loved, I loved being an illustrator. I loved being an art director assistant art director it, it, it the, the steps along the way are are so much fun mm. um and i really believe in the mentorship system you know uh the ment hollywood is is uh, historically uh a mentorship uh machine the, it's it's very difficult there there are there are of course some great film schools and and some schools with production design emphasis or, or, or degrees, but there's no, um, there's nothing like real world experience. And, um, you know, I dropped out of college and started working when I was like 19 years old really? in, in uh, and, and I was lucky enough well, to 19, sort of so attach. You, you probably dropped out early then like freshman year. Didn't you? I had, I did. I think I, I dropped off. I, I had two years of, of junior college and then my parents were very supportive and they said, well, you know, you could, we could spend a hundred thousand dollars on film school or something, or you could just go make a movie or you could go, uh, work on a movie. And so early on, I decided that because I didn't have any, my family had no money anyway, <laughs> that it, uh, I had an opportunity to, to, to actually work on, on a, on a movie as a, as a, an entry in an entry level position working in visual effects actually and that was my film school for a year you know and 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 the thing is is you're always learning it's still my film school the the i'm still that i i'm most attracted to to movies that that offer me that i'm scared of because mm. i know i'm going to learn something that I, I i had never i had never done i had never worked in alberta before i never made a movie like ghostbusters afterlife and so and i learned so much from the experience and that's what's ultimately the most rewarding thing about my job so i i, I think that i can't uh encourage people you know young up-and-coming production designers enough to really find mentors to um to learn from and to work under 
and to really uh, have amazing experiences uh, with. Um, and uh, I, you know, I I started working with a production designer named Bo Welch for many many years. Learned so much from him, and then another I was probably. You know, I was almost 10 years working with Bo Welch and then uh, then with Alex McDowell, another great production designer, both production designers who had completely different sort of approaches. But I was able to, as I'm I'm, uh, more established, I can draw from those experiences and and really um, and and use those those experiences to make to try to do a better job in my own approach. You know, great advice. Uh, the movie's awesome. Ghostbusters, Afterlife, and Francois Audrey. Thank you. Th- uh, th- see, I got my. T- I'm so <laughs> concerned with saying the name wrong. My my, I got tongue tied. Francois Audrey. There it is. And Ben, Ben, Ben. Yeah, exactly. Ben, not That's Connor, right. Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you exactly. so much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. You've been great. It was a great film, and I'm excited to have you back for the next one. Where can people go to learn more about you? Uh, go to my website, uh, audui.com, A-U-D-O-U-Y.com. Um, I've got such a weird name that I'm also Audui on Twitter and Instagram. There you go. Unique. Audui.com. Francois Audui, thank you so much for being on the show. We'll have you back for sure on your next project. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. All right, I want to thank Francois Audui, production designer for Ghostbusters Afterlife, for coming on the show and talking to us all about his experiences. I hope you guys learned a lot. I know I certainly did. And thank you to uh, Matthew Benson on Instagram for your question. I hope he answered it to your liking. I want to thank Connor Crosby, who is also the producer of this show. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com. Uh, And you can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, where we put uh, the video of our interviews there. So if you're listening to us and you say, I have to know what these people look like, you can find us on YouTube. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. So hit subscribe, search Go Creative Show, hit subscribe. You'll never miss an episode and all the better for it. All things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. And if you're interested in what I'm doing with my production company, you can find me on Instagram at Ben Consoli at Ben Consoli. Thank you guys for listening us to Ba. Thank you for joining us today and we will see you next week on another episode of the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.